On behalf of the Computer History Museum in Mountain View, California, it is my privilege to welcome Mr. Ratan Tata for a conversation. My name is Uday Kapoor, and I am a volunteer in the Oral Histories Program at the museum, the world's leading institution in preserving and presenting the history of computing, semiconductor technology, entrepreneurship, and more recently, software. Mr. Ratan Tata was the chairman of Tata Sons, the holding company of the Tata Group from 1991 till his retirement on December 28, 2012, his 75th birthday, when he was conferred the honorary title of Chairman Emeritus of Tata Sons. Tata Industries, Tata Motors, Tata Steel, and Tata Chemicals. During his tenure, the group's revenues grew manifold totaling over $100 billion in 2011 to 2012. He has recently returned to his leadership role as chairman of Tata Sons temporarily. Mr. Tata serves on the board of directors of Alcoa and is also on the international advisory boards of Mitsubishi Corporation, JP Morgan Chase, Rolls-Royce, and the Monetary Authority of Singapore. He is the chairman of the Sir Ratan Tata Trust and Sir Durabji Tata Trust, two of the largest private sector promoted philanthropic trusts in India. He is the chairman of the Council of Management of Tata Institute of Fundamental Research. He also serves on the board of trustees of Cornell University and the University of Southern California. The government of India honored Mr. Tata with his second highest civilian award, the Padma Vibhushan, in 2008. He has been appointed Honorary Knight Grand Cross of the Most Excellent Order of the British Empire, Commander of the Legion of Honor by the Government of France, and Rockefeller Foundation has conferred him with a Lifetime Achievement Award. Among his other achievements, Mr. Tata is also an Honorary Fellow of the Institute of Mechanical Engineers, the Royal Academy of Engineering, and a Foreign Associate of National Academy of Engineering. He has received honorary doctorates from numerous universities in India and abroad. So with that, uh, we will start with Mr. Tata's early life. Uh, you were born in Surat, Gujarat, British India in 1937. I was born in Bombay. Oh, you were born in Bombay. So My I had the My father was British. born in Surat. I see. Thank you. Okay. So I stand corrected. OK. Uh, so at this stage, I would like you to say a few words about your early life. OK. And uh, we can take it from okay. there. OK. Um, as, you, as you just indicated, I was born in, in Bombay uh, and lived my early life in Bombay. When I was uh, seven, my father and mother separated, which is not so common in those days. Yes. And both my brother and I were brought up by my grandmother, who played a very significant role in my early life. I continued to go to school in Bombay. Uh, and when I graduated from high school, I went to the U.S. And I was in the U.S. for about 10 years. I went to Cornell from where I graduated as an architect and then moved to Los Angeles because I never got used to the cold weather. <laughs> so uh, moved to Los Angeles and worked there in an architect's office for about three years. And then came back to India because my grandmother was ill. And that changed my whole life. Right. So I, I was going to come back to that. I've, your uh, history starting from the college, we can come back to that. Yeah. Uh, but I wanted to spend a little more time on your childhood. OK. Uh, as you mentioned, uh, you were raised by your grandmother. Uh, what was your childhood like? And what were, were there any mentors and special teachers that you remember? 
As I mentioned, my grandmother was probably the most influential uh, force that existed at that time. Uh, we lived in a big house, which my grandfather built, but never got, never lived to see finished. He had a, a hobby of collecting art. The house was meant to be his private museum, but as he didn't finish it, most of his collections are in the Prince of Wales Museum in right. Bombay. Right. Uh, my grandmother was a very interesting person. She was Lady Ratan Tata. Yes. Um, she was a, a very disciplined person, very intent on making sure that she lived a life with dignity, and she made my brother and me follow the same stringent uh, codes, if you might. I see. Uh, we were often ashamed of, of some of the trippings or, that, we, that we had as uh, the two sons of a, a very affluent family. Yes. And uh, I, I remember, for example, when going to school in Bombay, um, my grandmother used to have a, a huge Rolls Royce, which, which is quite old at that time. And it would embarrass my brother and me to be seen in that. So we'd walk home nice. and the car would follow us <laughs> because it was so ostentatious. Uh -huh. So we had many issues like that in my early days. Uh, they were very happy days because she was very understanding and, and yet very demanding. So uh, we lived a life of luxury. We went, spent three or four months in, in the UK with her they, she and her husband had a huge estate in in London, in Twickenham outside London. I see. Uh, which I have promised the county council, which now owns the place, to go and visit, but have not as yet done so. I see. So, to sum up, it it was a a very nice and and reminiscent of good times, childhood that we had. I see. Uh, and uh, she was probably the most significant uh, force at that time. Right. So in terms of, um, it is such a fantastic legacy of the Tata's were you exposed to the values of the Tatas in your early life? I can't answer that uh, consciously, but I'm, I'm sure we were opposed to, I, I'm exposed to it. Right. Because they, my father, my grandmother, and everybody lived by those standards. Right. But it was not consciously imposed on us. Um, the legacy of being fair to all, tremendously strong legacy of equality among, we were never a family that shouted at our servants or treated them like dirt or, right. and there was a great deal of equity in terms of how we treated them and most of the people that worked for my grandmother and my father served them for 40 years or 50 years, uh, as the case might be. Right. right. So I would imagine the, the underlying thing was never to do anything that, that would make, bring shame to the family. Sure. So, so when uh, were you exposed to, for example, the life 
of Jamshedji Tata. Uh, do you remember when you learned about his contributions and his legacy? My, my grandmother would have been the only person that, when we were young, who had met and lived in the presence of Jamshedji because Sir Ratan was his younger son. Yes. So she, in her early days of marriage, they lived in a splendid house, which is Jamsaji's home. Yes. And she used to talk of Jamsaji at, at some length, but somewhat superficially. The yes. only thing I remember was that she said, you, you couldn't take your eyes away from his eyes. I see. It was, she kept on saying that, that he had, you know, penetrating eyes. And apart from that, she didn't talk very much. I, su I suppose in those days, a young bride was a young bride. Yes, yes. And exactly. not much uh, interface. Yes, uh, yes. So uh, in terms of, uh, uh, so that's a good segue into uh, the legacy of the Tatas. I have read a lot about Jim Sheji and of course ev throughout my life history I've been yeah. aware of Jim Sheji and as you said his visage which is so impressive. Um, and uh, we, he's considered the founder of course of the whole Tata vision and the whole industry but also intertwined with the industrialization of India. Yes. Because of the way that he saw tomorrow and the way he set up the industries. So I uh, wanted to talk to you about a little bit. Uh, he was born in Navsari in 1839 in southern Gujarat to a family of Parsi priests. And he moved to Bombay at the age 13. Uh, and uh, so, uh, can you tell me a little bit about your perspective on his contributions? Well, I, from what I'm able to gather and, and just a little aside, I, I lived six years in Jamshedpur, right. which is very much Jamsaji's major creation, the Tata Steel. Yes. So much of what I'm about to say, I would have picked up in my six years in Jamshedpur, right. apart from my own uh, guess at what Jamsaji was like. To me, he seemed to be a person of extraordinary vision and a great nationalistic spirit. Uh, he was able to foresee independ independent India, which it was not at that time, but a ma manufacture of goods and services, more fundamental goods and services, or basic goods and services. And if it existed on imports, he set himself the task of why could it not be done by us? Right. So the first industry he established was textiles in Nagpur. Yes. Where I'm told the British uh, talked of uh, Lancashire having the ideal climatic conditions to to spin cotton into yarn. Yes. So he picked Nagpur because it had the same moisture content as as Lancashire did. Yes. So there was, you know, an element of analysis and and an element of uh, purpose in in this. He he added India's first atomized moisture in the plant. There was sprays in spray of water that provided the correct moisture content. And he produced the first textile mill. It was also the first uh, company to have public shareholding. Right. So he did this. Uh, then that was, didn't uh, fulfill his quest for uh, establishing industry. Right. 
I think the next one he did was either uh, steel, steel or or hotels. Yes. In the case of steel, I think that's very well documented. He yes. produced a steel plant, uh, which the British thought could never be done. Right. And uh, he did it. Yes. He picked. I believe he went on horseback and elephant to find the confluence of iron ore, and and coal, coal, water, yes, yes. and built the plant in Jamshedpur. Yes, he did a lot of study in U.S. and in Britain. Yeah, he and uh, amazing amount of research. He he went to the U.S. to pick a consultant who would yes. come and run the plant. Yes. Uh, he, the plant was Indian, the, the thinking was Indian, but he didn't produce a second-class plant. He produced a world-class plant in yes. those days. The best equipment, yes. And uh, he had the foresight to buy about 25 square miles of land, which became the city of Jamshedpur. Right. Sakchi was the name of the city before. That, that's right. Yes. That's right. Uh, then, in terms of power, yes, he he foresaw that the hills around Bombay would provide hydro head head of water for a hydro project. Yes. So the next one or next or the next early one was uh, Tata Electric Companies, yes. which had the Heidel power at a time when when no other similar power existed. Yes. The hotels, as you may know, is a funny story of his. Yes. He was the largest uh, landowner in Bombay. To the British put a ban on his owning any more land. So he owned the Royal Bombay Yacht Club. And he was taken for lunch there by his one of his British friends, but not allowed entry into the place because he was not fair skin. Right. And he was incensed by that because he owned the building. So he decided that he would build a hotel that was uh, open to everyone. Right. Which is how the Taj that came is, to be. Right. right. And. Uh, all these industries are not the normal consumer industries or manufacturing industries. They are the backbone of, an, of a country, steel, right. uh, textiles, power, right. and accommodation. So in terms of his thinking, uh, when he visited England and he studied uh, liberal thinkers, uh, Ruskin, yes. uh, people like those, and yeah. so uh, he developed his thinking for enlightened capitalism and constructive philanthropy based on his liberal uh, upbringing or thinking yeah. in England. Uh, is, is that true? Is it you? I guess it was. I, I don't know except he, he was, just like I mentioned, a great uh, a person who believed in the equity in dealing with your fellow man. Yes. He intuitively trusted people. He he respected merit, tremendous respect for merit. Uh, not family or or uh, unions of other sort. He he respected a a capable person when he saw him and allowed him to operate the, there are many stories about him traveling on trains and seeing somebody or talking to somebody that that he felt had merit and in inviting him to come and work for for him right right so uh, i i guess if he had lived on we would have had more basic industries 
with his two sons uh, finish those projects for him exactly. and he never got to to see them completed exactly so one aspect that i read about was his love for education for and the love for education and also making sure that a nation is built based on uh, education and uh, scientific research and scientific uh, studies yeah and uh, that is also one of the uh, basis for his dream for the advanced scientific um, institution like the Indian Institute of Science yes. in Bangalore, yes. which he did not complete, but as you mentioned, yes. his sons completed. Yes, a, another example of a nation building of a foundation uh, in scientific education, the Indian Institute of Science at a time when India never really dreamed of being in a part of the scientific world. Right. Uh, was again as far sighted and as visionary as, as you could be in, in those days. Exactly. So, of course, uh, uh, going forward on uh, Indian Institute of Science, it has been such a place where the distinguished names that have been associated with it Sir Visvesh Saraya, Nobel Laureate, Dr. C. V. Raman, Dr. Homi Bhava. Dr. Vikram Sarabhai and Dr. Satish Dhawan. This is, yeah. of course, going forward, but it laid the basis for education and creating people like that. Yes. Which is really amazing. And again, this goes back to the linkage of nation building and how India's industrialization. And uh, he was also a true nationalist in that he cared about the future enough that he was in, uh, it was said that he attended the first meeting of the Indian National Congress with Dadabhai Naraji, yeah. who was a friend of his. So a lot of nation feeling for the nation as a whole, future nation. Yes, between him and, and Sir Ratan Tata, there was a lot of uh, early support financial support and other, otherwise of Mahatma Gandhi and some of the early uh, stalwarts. Gokhale, Mr. Gokhale. Yes. Gokhale. Uh, and, and great support for an independent India. Yes. Not openly so, but, but nevertheless, the home we were brought up with had a lot of pictures of of Mahatma Gandhi, who, who stayed at their London house for, for some time, etc. Um, of course, um, uh, you know he uh, sadly passed away in 1904 at Bad Neuheim in Germany. Yeah. And um, once Jawaharlal Nehru, note, Jawaharlal Nehru once wrote about him, said that when you have to give the lead in action, in ideas. The lead which does not fit in with the very climate of opinion, that is true courage. And that it is the type of courage and vision that Jamsheshi Tata showed. That shows yeah. the giant of a man. Yes, he, you know, the softer option was never to do these things because they all came from the UK. Right. So why do it? Uh, and he had this nationalistic spirit that we could do it and we must do it. And much later, many over a hundred years later, we became exporters to the UK. Right. So, uh, you know, he, in a manner of speaking, was way ahead of his time. Yes, exactly. So after Jamshechi, Duraji uh, became chairman of Tata Sons and worked hard to fulfill the great plans of his father, Yes, as you mentioned. And uh, three months before Sir Duraji's death in 1932, he created two trusts, Sir Duraji Tata Trust and the Lady Tata Memorial Trust, who passed away before him. Yes. Uh, and he bequeathed all his wealth to his trust, which enabled India with its premier institutions like the Tata Institute of Social Sciences, Tata Memorial Hospital for Cancer, 
the Tata Institute for Fundamental Research and the National Center for the Performing Arts. These are premier institutions for the country. Yeah, that, that is true. Uh, after Sadaraji, Sadnaroji Saklatwala became chairman and he actually did some financial consolidation of several Tata companies enabling future growth of the group. This is what I read. Yeah. And he passed away in 1938 and then Jerdy uh, succeeded him as the fourth chairman. Uh, and so we can spend some time on Jerdy, okay. uh, another giant of a man. Uh, Jamsechi's cousin, uh, Mr. R.D. Tata, director of Tata and Sons, had moved to Paris and set up business there. He married Suzanne Bruyere, a French lady. And their eldest son, um, J.R.D., was born in 1904. And he grew up and was educated in France. Uh, so, uh, and then, of course, there is a lot of uh, thing that we can talk about. But uh, tell me about your perspective <laughs> on, on what you know about J.R.D.'s early life. Or well, I, I really, if I go back, my earliest uh, recollections of Jay were uh, Jay is as we all loved him and called him. him. Yes. Uh, my earliest exposure to him was relatively unfriendly. Ah, I see. Uh, I mentioned I was in college in the States. And often we used to run into each other when he visited the Tata offices in in New York, uh -huh. in in New York City. And he was very, uh, I would say, not even cool. He was very cold, and you felt you were interfering in his in his busy schedule. And he let you know that that was the case. I see. So you. It was more uh, how you, what you're doing. He asked the same question each time. Um, how long have you been here? Why did you come to the US? Uh, just very uh, perfunctory sort of conversation. It was in Jamshedpo and during the six years that I was there that we started to get to know each other when he came. We shared a common passion that we both were pilots. Right. And I would say the fact that we both had a love for flying and aviation that just transformed somebody who was here into somebody very close to him. Right. Uh, and he asked me to. I look upon it as a test. He asked me to start a flying club in Jamshedpur. And my first uh, exposure to an entrepreneurial exercise of raising money, of going to Hindustan Aeronautics to buy the first plane, getting government accreditation to operate a flying club, and then telling him it's done. Uh, and then we became closer and closer. Uh, one day he appointed me as the chairman of Tata Industries. And a few years later, a director of Tata Sons. So. Uh, talking about his love of aviation, of course, that showed up in his starting the you know, Tata flying uh, institutions like later on here. In yes. And his love for flying, as you said. Uh, so uh, you mentioned that you also had love for flying. Uh, was it through JRD or was it an independent? No, it was purely independent. I see. And it just became a common bond I between see. us two. Right. So did you also learn flying in Bombay or was it? Yes, I, I learned flying in Bombay, but was too young to solo. I was 14 years old and I had to stop. Nice. 
then when I went to Cornell, I started flying again the, okay. the uh, legal age to get a license was 17. And on my 17th birthday, I soloed and, right. and I've been flying ever since. Right, uh, right. Interesting. So in 1938, Sir Noroji suddenly passed away and all other directors senior to him elected JRD at the age of 34 as the chairman of Tata Sons, making him head of the largest Indian group uh, at that time. Yeah. And of course, that was unusual, you know, in those days uh, for a young person like that. Yes. Uh, but um, and then, of course, he stamped his style of working on the organization by democratizing the working of Tata's, by uh, changing the common chairmanship model for example. Uh, and at that time, as you mentioned, in 1945, a wholly owned subsidiary of Tata Sons called Tata Industries was set up. Uh, he later on made you chairman, but yeah. uh, this was set up in 1945, yeah. is what uh, I read. And this was set up to increase professionalism in the management of the companies. Um, also, articles of association of the leading Tata companies were amended to make social responsibility beyond the welfare of employees part of their objectives. And that was, again, his emphasis in uh, Tisco, in uh, Jamshedpur, to make sure that you take care of not only your employees, but also the town for the city. And you know, may I just add something yes. there? Uh, <clears throat> If one were to go around Jamshedpur, you would understand the significance of what JRD did. Uh, you had this island of wealth. I say wealth because the workers had wealth. They had company housing. They they lived a much better life than the villagers around the right. around the plant and by being sensitive to the upbringing of those villagers by giving them education by giving them medical assistance by creating industries for example stitching uniforms for the factory lunches you know, making food, giving the women uh, livelihood. Right. He created a situation where Jamshedpur, as against some other uh, industry towns, has no rancor between the villagers and the the wealthy worker of, of right. the of the industry but a oneness which uh, is quite noticeable in, in Bihar or Jharkhand today. Right. Uh, the different term of what it is in Bihar or Jharkhand of today, and built on cooperation and coexistence, which came from, look, and, and was the start of CSR, social responsibility by industry right. to try and find water, to try and increase crops and, and such. So the island spread yes. in terms of width. And it's very significant and not so easily determinable in, in print, if you might, right. unless you go there. Right. Actually, it so happened I was born in Bihar. I was born in Jharia. Oh, I see. Uh, and uh, my father was uh, worked for Indian Iron Steel Company. Okay. So I grew up in a household which was again an island. It was a British built. So Bhiman Mukherjee's. Uh, yeah, right. So my yeah. father knew him. Yeah. But uh, the thing that you mentioned, the disparity between affluence and the villagers, and you know, I, I saw that as a child. Yeah. So yeah. very much so. Yes. Did you lived in Burnpur then, or uh, no? We were in uh, Jitpur. That was the name of the colliery. I see. And um, we, because there were no good schools, uh, my brother and sister, we lived in Amritsar. 
oh, with our grandparents. So I we see. had a reverse commute. We would go I, to I uh, Jitpur during the summer vacations. I see. And so uh, there are many stories I can tell <laughs> you. <laughs> but uh, I very much appreciate Jim Shetpur. I have met many people. Yeah. Uh, there's a gentleman that I know in the Bay Area whose dad actually was one of the foremen in Jamshedpur and when you were doing your you, uh, work in the beginning after Cornell, yeah. you worked with him, with for him. Yeah, I was on the shop floor for about three yes. years. His uh, name was Arun Bose. Who? Arun Bose was his name, uh, yeah. you may not recall. And his son's name is Ajoy Bose, uh -huh. who did, he was at Bell Labs. Uh, and uh, he, he talked to you because Arun Bose told you that uh, please talk to uh, my son. He wants to go abroad and you advised him I on see. Uh, going to college. So this is, of course, many years ago. Um, so in 1970, the government imposed MRTP, the Monopolies Restrictive yeah. Practices Act, mandating the group to enforce a loose federal type of management of the company and Tarasan Industries directors in charge of various companies were withdrawn and the autonomous boards ruled the company. This really changed the nature of Tata uh, yes. operations. Uh, and it was purely JRD's talent, energy, charisma and vision that drove the companies to achieve great results in spite of the autonomous nature of the structure. Uh, because, of course, it created people that became powerful bosses of individual companies. But it was JRD's talent that kept it together. Yeah. Would you believe, or would you think Oh, yes, I, I do. I, I credit him with creating the group that became the, the nucleus of a bigger group later. And had he not done that, it would have disintegrated into discrete companies. Right. We, we owned very little of those companies. I think when I took over, we had about four or eight percent ownership in Tata Steel. And our ownership in each of the major companies was very small. Yes. And it was Jayadi's uh, persona and the con confidence the shareholders had in him that created at that time a virtual group, but not a group, because we had no major shareholding or legal binding on us. And one had to make those changes after JRD because right. one didn't have his Right. Uh, charisma and, and have a chance to do it on the basis of non-ownership. Yes, yes. So, and his achievements were remarkable given the Tata Group operated under wage and price control, high import duties, ban on imports and capital controls. He was able to prevent the nationalization of Tisco, for example. You know, he, yes. He, so, quite a remarkable achievement. Yeah. Uh, when he took over, Tata Group had 14 companies with sales of 280 crores. And when he stepped down, sales had increased 30x. And they were 50 large manufacturing companies, not counting innumerable holding, investment, subsidiary, and associate concerns, making, making it India's biggest business group. Yeah. So his achievements are just amazing, especially going through the partition, and all these controls and all that. Actually, his, his contribution is, is really remarkable because, because of MRTP, we never received a, a license to enter a new business or to grow in a business. Yes. And despite that, we grew to the extent we had, and most importantly, we grew without succumbing to corruption, yes. uh, to bribery, to payouts. Yes. Uh, none of those, none of those props were our, our uh, content or our DNA. Yes. So he set new moral standards for India, certainly for us to follow, 
and uh, we've been doing the, our best to follow them continuously since then. Yes, I know that the Indian government, I mean, Jawaharlal Nehru respected him. And of course, he was conferred the highest civilian award, the yeah. Bharat Ratna. Uh, so he, he more than deserved it. I mean, what a figure. Um, and as an internationalist, uh, JRD became widely known and admired outside India. Yes. He was, uh, of course, a true internationalist. As he was the chairman of um, Air India, which led to his serving a term as chairman of the IATA, International Air Transport Authority. And he served as a consultant to the Nobel Foundation in Sweden, along with Nobel laureate Dr. Linus Pauling. Um, and uh, of course, as uh, during the dusk of his uh, career, uh, some of those um, uh, structures in the companies started to uh, impinge on the performance of the company, of the Tata group mm -hmm. as a whole. Um, and at some point it seemed like there was a possibility that the Tata group may dissolve into separate companies. Is there something you'd like to comment on that? No, that, that phenomena has re-emerged many times when you have uh, CEOs of those companies who, who suddenly feel that they could move out and become a bigger fish in a pond. And uh, when I got involved, Jay was already a more elderly person and given to looking at soft options more often than he did when he was younger, which is a natural pheno aging phenomena. And would, he would allow this to take place and he and I would disagree on, on whether that should be, whether, uh, let's say, a Tata Chemicals or a Tata Power should be its own company and not be governed by Tata Sons. Right. Uh, so it has happened through the years. Tata Steel tried to, Brucey Modi of Tata Steel tried to take it away from central control. And, and when Jay realized that, he brought everything back into, into focus. But that phenomenon has happened on more than one occasion. Right. But MRTP also restricted his, his options, is that true? Well, MRTP actually uh, tend, tend, if, you were, if you were considered to be an MRTP company, you couldn't grow without the permission of the government. You couldn't you were restricted in what you did. So the, the aim was to stay out of MRTP. And uh, that was one of the phenomena that was in favor of carving companies out because they ceased to be MRTP companies and were freer to grow, etc. That was the rationale many a times for taking it away. Ah, right. So, in any case, so uh, in 1991, he decided to step down and propose that uh, you become chairman of Tata Sons. Uh, and um, we'll come back to that a okay. little bit more. And so now, I think, um, unless you have some no. other comments, we want to start with your uh, career. And truly, starting from your uh, days in the U.S. Uh, when you went to Cornell. Yeah. Uh, by the way, my son uh, just did his PhD at Cornell I see. Uh, in biology and ornithology, uh -huh. and now he's doing his postdoc um, at Cornell. At or? Cornell, I see. Yeah. So you graduated with a BS degree in architecture and structural engineering from Cornell in 1962, and as you mentioned, you worked in the U.S. briefly yeah. in Los Angeles. Uh, and you returned to India in 1962 at the urging of your grandmother. Uh, Lady Ratan Tata. 
and then you train in the shop floor of Tisco, as you mentioned. Um, then you were so maybe you can take it from there, and we can talk a little bit about your work as a director at Nelco and uh, other places. Okay. Um, and if you want to add anything else, all right. please do. I actually came back with an um, with a letter of appointment to IBM. I see. Uh, and so I came back to India uh, and actually worked for IBM for about 15 days okay. till Jayadi telephoned me and he said, you can't work for IBM. You ha if you're here, you must, <laughs> must work in Tata, so you couldn't say no right. <laughs> to, to him. And so uh, I, I remember using IBM's electric typewriters because mm -hmm. they were neat in those days. Right. And did this, the resume that Jayadi wanted from me <laughs> to give to him to process uh, my employment. Right. I uh, was then shipped out to Jamshedpur on the shop floor uh, in Telco, not not in steel. Okay. Uh, so I was involved in looking at the never never really a meaningful assignment, but a, a tremendous learning experience. So I was placed in the in the automotive plant for trucks. I see. And then a year later, I was moved to Tisco. So at that time, Telco uh, had already been acquired from Eastern Railways, and yes. locomotives were, had been. They stopped. were still making steam okay. locomotives, okay. Uh, but the jewel was the new Tata Mercedes Benz ah, uh, of truck. Right. Uh, truck plant. Right. And uh, headed by Germans at that time. Yes. And, uh, but probably right now, if you look at the manufacturing facilities at that time, they were very, very Spartan. But for the day, it was a state of the art truck plant in the Pride of India, if you might. Of course. Uh, so I worked in on the shop floor of Tata Steel, and then moved to the project office and went through several assignments in Tata Steel until I became the technical assistant to the managing director, Mr. Nanavati. Of course. And then I was called back to the head office in Bombay. Nice. That time, Mr. Mulgaukar was the vice chairman of Tata Steel. Yes. And uh, I then was asked to go to Australia to do a joint venture, which I did. I was there for six or seven months in Sydney. And uh, came back and was asked to go back to Jamshedpur, which I refused. I see. Uh, that changed my career a little bit. I joined a fledgling company called TCS at that time, uh, which was involved, this was in 71, was involved in uh, TCS's work was to get paper documents from U.S. corporations, convert them to punch key, to punch cards, right. and ship the cards back because at that time information technology was moving away from paper bills and paper documents to punch cards. Right. And IBM had these machines that would run through punch cards and print them out. so. I didn't realize you work for TCS. 
six because, months or so. Because I was going to, in fact, spend some time on TCS. This is a consultancy service. Yes. But it started off as a Tata Computer Center with uh, Lalit Kanodia and uh, yes, and so at, I was at, there in Kanodia's time. Oh, you were. Yeah. Okay. So at, it's just that time that yes. uh, okay, because they had just come from MIT. Uh, That's right. Uh, and uh, there were two other gentlemen, um, you know, uh, but uh, in any case, the. Uh, so uh, that's very interesting that you were there during the time of the data processing. Yeah, Kohli was the chief. He later, right? No, Kohli was, Kanodia worked under Kohli. Sure. And Kohli was the chief. There was another person called Ashok Malhotra. Yes. Who then went to MIT. Yes. Uh, and so it was a small, we occupied one floor of Nirmal building. I see. Uh, and the business was very, very small. Computers were banned, no, they were banned a little later. Yes, yes. But... Uh, and I believe it was a 1401, IBM 1401. That's right. That you were using. That's right. Yes, yes. Yeah, so because I wanted to, since I am representing the Computer History Museum, I wanted to spend some time on what the computing part of things. Uh -huh. uh, and the true, I remember reading that uh, Dr. Homi Bhava actually had some correspondence with John Neumann. John Von Neumann. John? Von Neumann. He's the, the Von, oh, Neumann. Von Neumann. Yeah. His architecture is really the computer architecture, yeah, yeah. the standard architecture. And those were the early days. Uh, and he wanted to, uh, in fact, in 1948, he communicated with John Moy Neumann about possibilities of computing. And uh, Mr. R. N. Narsimha in 1955 worked on the first indigenously designed computer based on logic diagrams from the University of Illinois computer project, which was called the TIFRAC oh, okay. yeah. by. Uh, Nehru in 1962, but because of the cost and commitment, and it's a fast-moving world, uh, it was not a serious commitment. Yeah. You know. And uh, so then coming to the uh, Lalit Kanodia, an MIT graduate, that was in 1965. Uh, he got a. I was there in 71. So okay. So later. he he was actually it was very interesting that he was here. Uh, he came from MIT while to get married. And he was in Bombay waiting to get married. And he had to wait for six months, apparently. So he got a, a consulting position with the Tatas <laughs> I, I with uh, Rustam Choksi. OK. And uh, then uh, in that process, he got an opportunity to start a, a computer uh, operation, a data processing uh, for the Tata businesses. Then what I described was yeah. data processing. Exactly. So days. Nitin Patel and Ashok Malhotra joined him. Okay. They worked with him at the uh, MIT Mac project, which I was see. really about data processing, uh -huh. not so much of design of computers. Right. Uh, because he was, a, I think, a mechanical engineer. He did his mechanical engineering from IIT Bombay. Uh -huh. So uh, in terms of, uh, as we were talking about um, uh, the the TCS, origins of TCS, um, a time when um, Nitin Patel and Ashok Malhotra joined him, they used to work with him, with uh, Lalit Kanodia at, uh, MI at MIT. So they then operated uh, like an American management consulting company with the 1401, IBM 1401. And they gave seminars like electronic data processing and the management revolution. Yeah. So it became more of a seminar and thing. So it didn't really take off so much. It was only in 1968, it became TCS with a new strategy and with consultants to find application for the Tata companies. This is what I read. Okay, okay. Um, but of course, it ran into some anti-automation uh, kind of forces. Like LIC, the like you know the Life Insurance Corporation, they said we'll lose jobs if you automate a lot of the data processing. 
And I understand that your dad, Mr. Nawal Tata, he was a long time representative to ILO. Uh, he published uh, in 1968 a brochure called Automation, Blessing or Curse. Yeah. And in fact, he defended the use of computers yeah. in that. Yeah. And so, and so we can come back to TCS okay. later, but uh, okay. that's very interesting that you actually worked there for some time. Uh, so talking about, um, uh, I think you were, uh, please continue with your assignments, you know, like you were talking about besides. I, I was in uh, TCS for about six months. Right. Uh, and... Uh, I was enticed to, I was told that Tatas are going to go into the manufacture of colored television sets and uh, I was offered a position in that new company. I see. It was supposed to be in collaboration with Gründig of, of Germany. Germany. <laughs> I, it was a joke because uh, I, I went to Grindig two or three times, but I don't think there was ever a, a serious uh, effort to form that company because nothing happened. So I moved away from that, and uh, there was a small electronic company in the group. Nelco, yes. which no one wanted. It was making losses greater than its capital. And I took that because I was a little fed up with the group and I thought it, I had nothing to lose by trying to turn Nelco around. If I didn't succeed, I could always go back to the States. Right. And I was sort of at that inflection point. Sure. I learned a lot from Nelco because it was a company really in trouble. Uh, it produced radios. Uh, the time the industry was changing from valve radios to Transistor. semiconductor uh, radios. And the management of Tel uh, Nelco had decided that transistorized radios were a toy and so they remained with valve and oh, <laughs> the market just left them. They had about 80-90% of the market and then they ended up with 2% Wow, which is about the time I came into the picture and we revamped. There was a person Tata Power principally owned Nelco and uh, there was a person called KPP Nambia, who was the head of R&D. And together we designed a whole range of transistorized radios to be relevant in the market. And eventually we ended up with about a 20% share of the radio market. I was in Nelco for, we, we diversified into calculators and mini computers. We, we produced mini computer uh, uh, with uh, a California mini computer company. Uh, I can't remember its name. Uh, and we produced that, we marketed, marketed that. We went into drives and inverter systems, industrial electronics basically. And I was in Nelco for about 10 years. Uh, we became a profitable company. Not, all, not as profitable as we should have been. And we, right but profitable, we wiped out all the losses, etc. You also had some labor trouble there, some union strikes. Yes, I had, I, 
I said it was a learning experience. We, we, for the first few years, would not know every month whether we could make the payroll. And you had the best way to, to learn how to survive is to do it in adversary of course. conditions. And th then I had a labor problem with the Ship Center Union. Uh, with Mr. Bal Thakre. Hmm. Uh, we had a, a lockout. We took, we produced inverter systems and drive systems in flats that, uh, apartments that we rented so that we could meet customers' schedules. Right. It, was, it was a wonderful learning experience. And somewhere in that period of 10 years, J.R.D. called me and, and said, I'd like you to be a director on Tata Sons. Okay. So uh, I understand you also went to Harvard in 1975 for yeah. the advanced uh, business school management course. management course. Was that during that same time? Yes. I see. I needed a break at, sure. at that point in time. And uh, it was a 13, 13 week course. So I just just decided I, I would do it. Wonderful. And also, uh, I guess you were assigned to Empress Mills for some time. Yes, I, keep, I kept getting the troubled companies <laughs> one after the other, uh, which like I said, the flying club was a test. I think these were also tests. Right. Uh, so. <laughs> right. So, in 1978, um, uh, you know, you had been thinking about uh, the activities at Tata, and you sent some confidential notes to JRD, J, on two occasions, proposing changes in the strategic plans and operations of the Tata Group. Um, is that, do you recall? Yeah, I sat down in, actually in, in the 70s, probably just notes, but in 1982, I sat, my mother was uh, suffering from cancer and yes. was in Sloan Kettering. Right. And I had taken a leave of absence to to be with her. Yes. So I found myself sitting in the visitor's room for four months in Sloan Kettering. And I sat and wrote out a strategic plan for right. Tata's, which I presented when I returned. Right. Uh, and it was rejected. I see. So I picked the part that I could do and it was basically to enter the high high technology areas. Yes, uh, and it carved out uh, a plan, basically to go into areas which were disallowed for the private sector at that time. Right. So what, the in terms of the your chairmanship of Tata Industries that happened. Before that happened that. in eighty one. Yes. And you were made chairman of that industry. And that's the part I took to implement. Yes, right. In and then in '84, Rajiv Gandhi became the pr uh, prime minister. Yes, and it was as though he had read my my strategic Mine. plan because he <laughs> opened up those areas, which were which were earlier closed. Right. And suddenly, I found myself in a position to implement those plans. So we formed a joint venture with IBM. We we brought the IBM desktop and mini and uh, mainframes to India again. The IBM was thrown out of India, if yes. you recall. Yes, yes. My brother was with them here. When thrown out, he went back to the I US. see. Okay. Uh, yes. And so we formed a joint venture called Tata IBM. Right. 
We formed a joint venture and we entered the process control business with Honeywell. Yes. Uh, we went into oil, contract oil drilling with Schlumberger. I see. So these are the companies that were mentioned, Tata Honeywell, Tata Telecom, High Tech Drilling System, Keltron Telephone, Tata Finance, Matrix Materials. Keltron was not our company. I Keltron see. was what KPP Namia went I and formed okay. with the Kerala state government. Right. But yes, we formed several uh, companies who went into finances, financial services. Right. And uh, I think 13 or 14 new companies, in, mainly in the high-tech areas. Yes. And the Tata Alexi uh, as well, well, at that time. Tata Industries existed. Tata Alexi. Tata, Tata Alexi, which happened with Tampi. Tampi, yes. Right. So was that around the same time? Yes, they're all in that oh, same, same period. Same period, yeah. yes. Okay. And so, uh, Tata Industries had small holdings, uh, only 10 to 20 percent in each. Because it was a shell company yes. virtually. Yes. It had, so it would turn to the major Tata companies to invest in these new businesses. Yes. And it's the, the major Tata companies that earn the most money from this. Tata Industries never did, but it Yes. It fostered those businesses exactly. into exactly, um, and then in 1988, I think you took over chairmanship of Telco. Yes, uh, from Sumant Mulgaukar. That's right. And in March 1991, uh, when GRD stepped down as chairman, he proposed your name, and he called it. And the reason he gave was that you are more, you are like him. Uh, <laughs> And you have memory like him. Uh, there are two things that I read. Um, because you were, again, uh, you know, you were taking over when there were many other senior people. Yeah. Well, by that time, I was very close to him. Yes. And he was more like a foster father to me. And my real father was my father at home. Yes. But at work, Jay was like my father. Yes to a great extent, and we spent more time together than I did with my father at work. Uh, and we interacted much, much more every day at work than I did with my father. Yes. And he was my father at home when I came home, but yes. so... Uh, yeah, I remember when he was not well and uh, how you used to visit him and uh, give him updates. Um, Who? Uh, Jay? JRD, yes. Jay, uh, yes, to, to some extent, but he was, he left India uh, to, to take a winter break and uh, <clears throat> fell ill and went into the hospital and never came back. Mm -hmm. Mr. Mulgaukar was the one who was ill for a long period of time. We used to go every other day to brief him on things and get his views and his inputs. I see. Okay. And in 1991, right after, very closely after you were made chairman, uh, Dr. Manmohan Singh scrapped many of the MRTP provisions. Uh, yes. So the true liberalization started uh, yes. around that time, which was very good, uh, yeah. coinciding. And with what, what happened was that we rejoiced at that time and went forward in growing. And certain parts of the business community went into trying to uh, continue to have protectionism and we we just shot ahead because they were all busy in the powers of uh, the corridors of Delhi trying to block opening up and right. while the government was committed to that we we were able to get joint venture agreements done go and forge into areas that they did, they missed. 
Yes. So, so your first, one of your first tasks was to rebuild the linkage between Tata Sons and the other companies of the group. That's and right. Then, um, and of course, you had to deal with uh, strong individuals, yes. uh, Rusi Modi, um, uh, Darbari Seth, and Ajit Kerker, and Nani Palkiwala. Yeah. Uh, but they were, you also, you know, instituted uh, retirement age and so on, so that... Uh, yeah, that made me very unpopular. <laughs> later, later, I abided by my own retirement age, because right. right. it would have been wrong not to. Yes, yes. And uh, I think your original, uh, in a way, you updated the original strategic plan yeah. that you had proposed. And the thrust was of technology-driven leadership. Yes. Uh, and you brought in McKinsey to help with reorganizing the yeah. uh, company, where there were overlapping businesses and so on, um, which is... Um, and, of course, the other thing uh, I read about was the brand data that you brought in a, a common brand for all the companies. Yeah, I'd, I'd like to talk on that a sure. minute. We, we represented, the Tata Group represented itself in about 30 different ways at that time. Tata Chemicals had one logo, Tata Oil Mills had another, Tata Iron and Steel Company was something else. Telco was Tata Engineering and Locomotive Company. Each one had its own logo, its own identity. And yet we used to go and say we're the Tata Group. So we standardized on a particular logo which, and a certain graphic discipline, letterheads, uh, we changed the names of many companies. Tata Iron and Steel Company became Tata Steel. Mm -hmm. Telco became Tata Motors. Tata Chemicals, was re whatever it was, was renamed Tata Chemicals. And we got that sort of order in place. We created a logo which was across the board. And we created a, uh, an agreement that said, so long as you use the Tata name, etc., you abided by the following values and business practices. Yes. And if you fail to do that, we had the right to remove the name. Yes. So that was an attempt to identify the group as a group and to create synergy. A tremendous opposition to that when we started, but I think later they started to feel the benefits of that. Yes, yes. Uh, the other aspect that you emphasized was going abroad to start, what? going abroad to start investing yes. yeah. internationally. And uh, that's where your uh, emphasis on, you know, as you mentioned, uh, both on computers. Yeah, we made one, which I think you're referring to, one major change. Hitherto, Tata had never grown in, inorganically. They had always grown themselves. Right. And we said that we, shouldn't be op we should be open to inorganic growth, to making acquisitions or mergers, right. which at that point in time was very significant because we, we bought Chorus, which is uh, old British steel, and we bought Jaguar and Land Rover. Right. right. So that has uh, really paid dividends in terms of growth. Well, Jaguar and Land Rover has paid dividends. Chorus has, Chorus has uh, been a... The steel industry has been in the doldrums in yes. Europe. Yes. Yes. It's a challenge. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah. So uh, in terms <laughs> of the performance, overall performance of the group, uh, you certainly proved your detractors wrong, and you outperformed Jay. <laughs> By the time you retired, Tata Group had more than $100 billion, was the largest Indian multinational conglomerate, with larger than 65% of income from overseas, and about 100 operating companies spread across 56 countries. 
in six continents. You had spent close to $18 billion on acquiring 22 companies worldwide, uh, as you mentioned, uh, Tetley, Chorus, Jaguar, Land Rover, and the hotels, uh, New yeah. York's Pierre Hotel. Uh, and uh, it has, so it has an excellent track record. Also innovation, you were, the company was uh, nominated, uh, was actually the sixth best innovative company in the world by Business Week in 2008, the head of IBM and Sony and Nokia. There's a lot of innovation that happened in the company. And uh, of course, uh, as I mentioned in the introduction, you have been awarded numerous prestigious awards and recognized for your work and achievements. Uh, just amazing uh, history. Well, I think it's been a very exciting journey because India changed from a very protected, inward-looking economy to, to embracing the world, wanting to be recognized. In many ways, uh, all the things that JRD stood for and shouted for from the rooftops yes. happened. Yes. And, uh, and India emerged from an economic disaster country to one that has had a very high growth rate. Yes. Which I, I think we all should recognize what the government did at that in the 1984 yes. period. Yes, right. So going back to the uh, some of the high tech yeah. uh, emphasis that you brought into being, uh, history of computers in India uh, and the semiconductor technology, for example, uh, it has been fairly sparse, meaning the manufact design and manufacture of computers and manufacturing of semiconductors. I think there was Bharat Electronics uh, was one of the early people. Yeah. Uh, but uh, in terms of computers, because it's so fast moving, and uh, the investment requires are very, uh, it's very, very steep. Uh, was that a deliberate action to stay out of uh, computers as such? No, we entered the computer area with IBM. IBM. But uh, was that a joint manufacturing? Or? Yes. Okay. In, and why we broke up was IBM decided that in our monk decided that this was the only joint venture they had and they wanted to split it into Lou Gerstner just joined I see. and they wanted to split it into a software company which IBM would own right and a hardware company that Tata's would own oh, I see and at that time there was starting to be a realization that computer manufacture was a was a dud business and the money was in services right so we sold out the whole thing to IBM instead I at see. a very good price so okay. we didn't go into manufacture we did produce uh, i remember the name of the company quantel was the name of the company I see. Uh, producing mini computers, okay. uh, sort of this high, I see. Uh, and then we went into Alexi, which was uh, something that was not part of a. It was part of. We owned about fifty percent of Alexi, which mm -hmm. was a company that was a multiprocessor. Right. Uh, it shot up in sales in the first two or three years and NSA had about six of our machines. Each of the aircraft companies had a machine or two of Alexi. And then suddenly vector computers came on the market and 
the market disappeared ah, for Alexi virtually overnight. Right, right. And we lost everything we had at that time, but we we probably were the only Indian company that that actually took the risk to go into a multiprocessor to fight VAX, right. uh, which was the DEC yes. uh, gold standard at that time. Yes, yes. That's how the Sun Microsystem came into being. Sorry? The Sun Microsystems. Yes. They were yeah. the competitors. Yeah. Yes. So in terms of components of manufacturing of the computers, there were semiconductors were not invested in. You would acquire components from outside or? For the Alexi? Yes. Yeah, we bought all our computers, uh, semiconductors from Motorola. Motorola, yes. Okay. Because uh, that is another very high capital uh, kind See, of the, the government of India did some wrong things at that time. They threw out IBM and they decided that the only computer that would be manufactured in India would be by ECIL, right. which is a government uh, company. And that all the semiconductors would be produced by the Semiconductor Corporation of India. Right. They banned the import of, of uh, semiconductors. So LSIs and they came into being, etc., were not allowed for use. Uh, and the semiconductor investment in the country was in in uh, of the older generation and not not submicron at all yes. and. And there's no no market. They were just behind their times. Yes, yes. So we until until we brought IBM back in with the joint venture. Yes. They used to only be EC, ECIL <coughs> and the British company, British computer. I, I forget ICL. ICL. Yes. Uh, that were the two companies that that existed. Yes, right. So anyway, so that's a loss opportunity, but now it is extremely expensive to be yeah. in the semiconductor business. In fact, most companies have gotten out of yeah. manufacturing. Well, I always thought that what India needed to do is invest in a good semiconductor company uh, we obviously couldn't have any place in Intel, but in the smaller companies which had their own fab yes. facilities. Yes. Uh, but we have not done that. Right. And it has become so prohibitive now that even in the United States... It's better to buy off-the-shelf exactly. semiconductors. Yes, yes. No. And w the the key line is the ingenuity of circuit design, and not, yes. not yes. necessarily the uh, going back to silicon and trying to be self-sufficient. Exactly, the hardware has become very commoditized. That's right, yeah. and so it's really the software world. That's now. right, and so I wanted to come back to that uh, okay. when we talk about that. But before that, anything else about your career that you want to talk about because I want to then go to a section on the values, okay. data values and the guiding principles. I think I've covered most of what I could, okay. could Good. Thank think you. about. So in terms of uh, data values and guiding principles, you know, starting from Jim Shechi and, and the DNA that exists even today, uh, I read uh, like you had emphasized in your uh, some of your writings that integrity, understanding, excellence, unity, responsibility, those are some key values. Would you like to comment on that? I, I can't comment 
too much on them because they've been away from sure. the thing for some time. But basically, it was to protect the image that we had, to make it real and living, that we would be fair to all our stakeholders, to our customers. We would not overpromise uh, and underperform. We would uh, be fair to our employees and our customers and and that we would attempt to be different in terms of not being an example of favoritism but equality and we formed a we generated a a document which is a code of conduct yes. and we wanted each employee to read it and to sign it and sign it each year because it got changed marginally depending on what we did and uh, that we achieved. Strangely enough we wanted to to have all our directors sign that too. And then we had a pushback hmm. uh, where particularly outside directors uh, refused to sign our code of conduct stating that it impinged on the way they would run their company. And so we didn't succeed as well as we should have in creating a code of conduct that we could all say whether you were a sweeper or a managing director that you abided by the same right. conditions. Right. So, but still, uh, the image that Tata's have displayed has always been high integrity and high values well, and, and caring for social uh, Caring. That's what we would want to be known known yes. for. I think there have been some aberrations from time to time. How we deal with it is is our report card and not the fact that we have a workforce that may not have an errant individual that breaks the code of conduct at some time. But it, it happens, and how we deal with the situation when it does take place is, is what we should be uh, ga uh, gauged on. So uh, the other aspect that I have read about is a sense of boldness and a sense, a spirit of adventure. This is what also uh, over the ages Tata has stood for. Um, yes. And many uh, people like Mahatma Gandhi and Jawaharlal Nehru have mentioned that. You know, they've always admired uh, when there's a challenge, uh, whether it's a health challenge or a crisis, they would come to Tata's for help or for guidance or, or a vision. Yeah, there, there is a tremendous sense of spirit in the organization that you can mobilize at the time of any crisis almost on a volunteer basis. So we have a very unique system with an entity called the Tata Relief, Relief Committee. Any national calamity, tsunami, earthquake, floods, etc., that happen this committee gets mobilized by employees, some of them senior employees, who leave their jobs and go and work at that community level for free. Uh, and then come back to their normal jobs when it's over. And we have done this, for example, when the tsunami hit Chennai and Kerala, uh, we built some 700 uh, homes for fishermen who would lost their homes. We have uh, 
adopted their children, the fishermen who disappeared. We adopted their children and sent them to school and created orphanages for them. All through this committee, what we do is uh, workers and employees give a day's wages. We either match them or give twice that amount or three times that amount. That becomes the kitty for, for that uh, calamity. Yes. And uh, then that money is spent by an organization that has been built. When the terrorist uh, attack... I was going to mention that. Uh, that is exemplary. Yeah, we, we formed a... We didn't form the committee, but we formed a trust to deal with anybody that got uh, hurt or injured or killed. Right. And uh, we've sent people to school. We've Our employees who got killed, we've offered their families their the equivalent of their salaries throughout their life as though they were continue to exist. Yes. So I, I think those things are the thing that make me most proud about what we stand for. You should be, yes. Another area that, uh, of course, a lot of help has been given is in the area of sports. Tata has, yes. uh, and so that, I just wanted to mention that. We don't yes. need to spend a lot of time on it. Uh, but. Uh, I wanted to get your view on, uh, we'll come back to philanthropy a little bit, but before that, let's finish on your vision uh, for the future uh, in terms of technology or uh, trust. I know that after you retired, uh, you personally were involved with many startups, uh, but I wanted to get some kind of overview of your... Well, I... I think the world is is changing, uh, and we have companies like TCS, which are heavily into information technology. Information technology itself is changing, and we need to be uh, looking at gaining a strong position in analytics, in machine learning, in, in some of the new technologies, which, which in fact will replace the human inputs of TCS in course of time. Yes. And we should not be in the same position as the valves versus transistors yes. that I mentioned. Yes. Uh, and we should be ahead of the curve, yes. making investments in that in those areas today. Yes. Uh, similarly, we, we should be looking at, at issues such as new forms of renewable energy, uh, things we're actually doing in the trusts rather than the companies. I'm suggesting the companies which are generating funds, large funds, should be making investments in these new areas today. And Tatas could be the people that, that when the dust clears, we're already in that area rather than not being so. Uh, and I, I'm concerned that we perhaps are not doing enough in that we're not taking enough risks to be to enter into new areas, and we are looking in, more inward again than we have done in the last fifteen, twenty years. So that is well said. Thank you so much. Not at all. So uh, the one topic I wanted to dwell on was philanthropy yeah. because philanthropy and data, uh, you can't separate them. Uh, and all of the time, and, and I have also read that it was really centered around nation building and it is not just individual giving or in, you know, institutions only. 
but a lot of the fundamentals that were set up uh, in the Institute of Science, uh, in the help servants of India society by Sir Ratan Tata, uh, and then all the institutions that were established, they have spawned other areas where are helping the nation. So just a summary comment from you. Uh, philanthropy is itself changed. 20, 30, 40 years ago, philanthropy was not a term one used, it was charity. And the charity was oriented towards uh, personal hardship. You, you had cancer, we, you came and asked for a grant and we gave you a grant to treat your medical expenses. Or if you lost a leg, uh, an artificial limb would be made available. That's what the trust would do for you. And if you had any personal hardship, you made an application and the trust would consider it. And if it passed their, their gates, they would assist you. And once in a way, we had a big major project, which might be a cancer hospital or the NCPA or uh, an institute like uh, Tata Institute of Fundamental Research, but they were far, uh, they were sp spaced out a lot in time. Today, the the trusts are being much more proactive in terms of investing in, for example, the, a project we do is the elimination of malaria by changing the DNA of the mosquito or uh, immunotherapy in cancer treatment or some of the, we are doing a project with uh, MIT on uh, <clears throat> low cost medical devices to make diagnosis and treatment available for the masses. The, we have started looking at how do we leave a community with a sustainable, with a sustainability capability rather than handouts. So we now disperse about a hundred million US dollars every year in philanthropic issues which still contain the, the individual hardship. In fact, we're about three or four times what we used to be. But the major, major uh, emphasis is on creating new uh, project for nutrition in the country. We're trying to embed iron to combat anemia in in rice and wheat and milk, which would be available to everybody. The state governments will do it. The technology is ours. Uh, so we've changed the complexion of what we do in the trust for philanthropy. We're we're getting involved with the bigger part of things. If if uh, immunotherapy eventually becomes a way of curing cancer, the next issue that we have to concern ourselves with is how do we get this wonderful new technology to be available to the millions rather than to a handful of rich people who can spend two hundred or three hundred thousand dollars on a treatment for themselves. But what about the millions that need it, which will never get it because the founders of the company will become billionaires? 
a few hospitals will will undertake this treatment. And um, what have we done? We've just made an elitist uh, contribution. So we're trying very hard to see if there is an innovative way that we can bring some of the new, because stem cells and and programming DNA and uh, some of the new discoveries are terrific and they can serve mankind, but they will not because they're only going to be available to the wealthy. Mm. And if we can find a way to to bring this to the tens of thousands, if not the millions, uh, then I think we could say that we made a difference. So that's where we are in philanthropy. Okay, thank you so much. That was very thoughtful. Uh, I wanted to, first of all, thank you for your time uh, at this time. Uh, and I really appreciate this. I think the museum will appreciate it. Mr. John Holler, who's the president of the museum, asked me to personally thank you Not for your time. Uh, and uh, one uh, aspect that I wanted to mention, uh, I read somewhere that um, there is a, a place in Pune where you have an archival. Yes. Uh, and I'm wondering whether we can collaborate with them for any future. Sure. So uh, I will follow up on that. Sure. And uh, of course, you have a standing invitation to come to the museum. All right. And we'll give you a personal tour of this. It's a very fantastic show. Okay. Piece. So the next time you're in the Bay right. Area, we would love to. I'm in the Bay Area about four or five times a year. Okay. So. so that will be wonderful. Okay. Thank Mr. you. Mr. John Holler will personally. Uh, and also, there are some very interesting programs which, which are national uh, level programs. So uh -huh. we'll talk to you about that. Okay. So thank you very much. Not at all. Thank you. It's a pleasure. Thanks. I enjoyed this. Thank you.